So today I would like to share with you how I grow sugar snap peas in my square foot gardens. This is one vegetable that I look forward to every year because I've oftentimes had a long cold winter with a lot of snow and I just love these little sweet peas. They are so sweet and I just love them. So when you decide that you want to grow peas too, you'll need to decide which kind you want to grow. And you'll have a choice of growing what are called shelling peas and you grow those mostly for the peas that are inside the pod. And then there's also snow peas, which you grow for mostly the pod. There's not a very big pea inside the pod. And then you have snap peas. And this is what I like to grow. It's a little cross between the two. You grow it for the pod and the pea. And the kind that I love to grow is called a super sugar snap pea. And they are disease resistant because one of the problems you might have when you grow peas is what's called powdery mildew and this will really cut down on the harvest so i really recommend growing what's called a super sugar snap pea and then you'll want to refer to the planting charts which are on the back of your book and these will walk you through exactly when you can plant your peas in the book it specifies to plant them five weeks before your last average frost date also, your pea seeds will germinate best when your soil temperature reaches at least 40 degrees Fahrenheit all the way up to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're not familiar with your last average frost date, just check for that online. It's very easy and oftentimes it'll just ask you to enter your zip code. So I've been growing peas now in my climate for probably about 10 years and I can pick up on little cues in my yard that tell me my soil is ready for me to plant my peas. So if you're new to gardening, you may not recognize the little cues that nature is sending your way, but for me, I can look at my daffodils and I know when they're starting to pop up, this is a good sign. Also, my chives will start to spring back every year. So when I start to see my chives turning green and popping up out of the dead chives, I know that my soil temperatures are reaching the perfect time for me to put my peas in the ground. Also, for me, I have a little pond and I hear my spring peepers just chirping away. These are the little frogs that live by my pond. And as soon as the temperatures start to warm up, I start to hear those little frogs and I know it's time for me to start looking at my spring garden a little bit closer. And another thing that you can do is take a meat thermometer and just stick it right in your soil. And as you can see here, my temperature is right around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is perfect for my peas. Now I will briefly touch here on the soil mix, which I think is a very important part of the square foot gardening method. Now in the third edition of the square foot garden book, there are some excellent charts there also on how to mix your soil using a five gallon bucket. So actually you could look up your bed size. Mine is the four by four and I usually just fill it with six inches of soil. And so it will tell me specifically in the book how many cubic feet of mix I need in my bed. And there are actually 24 different dimensions provided for you there in the third edition of the book. So I'll mix for you here one cubic foot so you can kind of see how we mix it. You'll need some peat moss and a good blend of compost along with some coarse vermiculite. And I have a very good video on my website that explains the difference between the different types of vermiculite and perlite. And you notice here the compost that I'm using is a very good blend of horse and cow manure, food waste, and plant matter. You really need to have about five additives, so I also like to use a little bit of some of my homemade compost. So the tools that I use when I make my mix is a large wading pool. Here you see I have just a small wading pool because I'm just going to mix one cubic foot, but you can use a large tarp as well, which is recommended in the book. So I'm going to use half of a five gallon bucket and I will need to put one part of each. So we'll fill it up half with the coarse vermiculite, half with the peat moss, 
and I like to wet this just a little bit because it's very dusty. You may need to use a mask and then just moisten it a little bit and that will help keep it from flying around. I like to buy the compacted peat moss versus what is loose in a bag because I get a lot more for my money when I buy it compacted. And then I make sure that the peat moss and the compost don't have very large lumps in them. So I'll just break those up and in goes the compost and we'll just give it a good mix. And there you have one cubic foot of the soil mix. So as I mentioned, if you're mixing up a lot, you can just get a big tarp and use that to keep it nice and tidy. So now it's time to plant our peas. Oh, about a week before I plan to plant them, I will soak them in water and I will put them in a little paper towel and a Ziploc bag so they can sprout. It takes about six to 10 days for them to germinate. So once they just have a little sprout coming out, um, I know it's time to get them in the soil. had to add an inoculant. I just wanted you to know that might be something that you'll need to do. And of course, whenever we are planting something new, we always want to put a little bit more compost in there so that we can continually build the soil. Now, this is a picture of my first square foot garden. I think it was about 12 or 13 years ago. And I used what's called the grid on my boxes. And if you're new to square foot gardening, it's a very good idea to make sure that you make a grid, which is explained in your book. And just, it kind of gets you used to how you're going to plant um, you know, every day in your square foot garden. Um, over the years, I have um, just started to use a ruler, which is 12 inches long, and I measure it out uh, that way. But when you first start out, I highly recommend that you measure your squares just using a grid. We're going to plant half of two squares. This is how I like to plant my sugar snap peas. And you need to make sure you have full sun for your peas. And I really shouldn't even have to mention that at this point because your beds should be in a very sunny location because your vegetables and herbs, most all of them are going to love that sun. So I'm planting half of two squares and I'm just going to plant those on the edge because I need to let these have a trellis so they can grow up. So I Normally you put eight per square, which is how I used to start peas. Now I have just adapted it over time and I'm only planting half the square that's closest to the edge. And we'll just put these, these sprouts side down about one inch. So I always use gloves when I'm working in my raised beds. And that's because um, we have, you know, just neighborhood cats that are outdoor cats and they can spread diseases if they use your bed as a litter box. And so oftentimes when I'm working my soil, I will find cat feces in my soil, which is, you know, it's just part of having a garden, I guess. Now I will leave links down below the video for other supporting videos in case you're wondering about some of the things I'm talking about. So you can just check that out. So now on the other side of the square, I'm just going to sprinkle out some dill seed. And I find that germinates very easy for me. This is just some seed that I saved a few years ago. And then always, of course, give the squares a marker so that you will know you planted something there. Also, you won't pull up the plants as they start to pop up thinking they're a weed or something like that. Now, normally I would water these in with a sprinkle can. You want to be very light, you know, nothing too heavy, maybe even a mist option on your um, hose nozzle. Uh, or just like I said, a little sprinkle can. Um, but we were expecting rain the next day, so that's not really necessary. I'm not going to water them in. And then of course we need to give them a trellis, something they can climb up. And um, I like to get just these little trellises. I think I got this one at a grocery store called Aldi as a seasonal item. You can find those in a lot of different places seasonally in spring. Um, and I think Big Lots is a good place to get them. Of course, your home improvement centers. And of course, this is a picture of where I got them at Aldi. Now, there are a lot of other ideas for um, DIY trellises in your book. So check that out too. So when your peas pop up and they start to grow, you can just gently move them over to the trellis and their little tendrils will wrap right around and they'll just climb right up them. 
I've also used this little garden arch between my beds. It's about four to five feet wide and it's just perfect for peas and I've also used it for green beans and tomatoes. Now once your peas start to get some weight on them and they're producing, they can break. So make sure you give them a little bit more support by tying them to your trellis to keep them um, from falling over. Also a hard wind could knock them over. So oftentimes I will just tie them up. I also on this arch, I'll tie a little bit of string in between it to give them just a little bit more um, things that they can climb on. So in the third edition of the Square Foot Garden book, they actually walk you through how to make an irrigation system for your beds. Um, but the old traditional way is to keep a water bucket in the garden and then just water your plants at the root a little about a cup once a week or whenever you notice that they are drying out. Now try to water your peas at the soil level if you can. And the reason why you want to do that because maybe you are not growing the super sugar snap peas which is a resistant variety to powdery mildew your pea may be susceptible to that. So watering at the root will help prevent that disease from taking over your peas. Now, if you're using a nice blended compost, as you should be using in your soil mix, you will not need to feed your peas. I've also had a problem with animals eating my peas. Rabbits love little sugar snap peas. So they will chew them down, and I'm sure deer will too. So pretty much the whole plant is edible. So you'll want to make sure you have some way to protect them. Also, and I think all three editions of the book, uh, it walks you through how to build a DIY crop cage. And it takes up a little bit of room. I've never uh, made one, but I think it's, you just use some simple materials like chicken wire and some wood. And so that should be pretty easy for some of you to do that. Now what I have used is bird netting and I will just measure that out to fit over my bed right after I have sowed all of my seeds before they have popped up and I will just try to protect them to keep the cats from getting in there and scratching them all up. And this is when I have a little bit extra time, I take this extra step. Now I will secure them down with a few wooden skewers and this will keep the cats away until my seeds come up. I have to make sure to remove this though because I don't want my seedlings growing up through the netting because then it's very hard to remove. So I like to remove that before the plants get too big. Now you may also find that you have a problem with insects and a way that you can tell is that your pea growth may become stunted. And if you check underneath your leaves, you may see little tiny pea aphids and they are very hard to see because they are camouflaged so well. Another signal that you might see that you have pea aphids is you'll see little what's called a little hoverfly around your peas. And these look like little tiny bees, and they will just kind of hover there. What they're looking to do is to lay their eggs near the aphids because the maggot of the hoverfly feeds on the aphids, but the adult does not. So the hoverfly needs to lay its egg right there near the aphids. And you will notice, like I said, also some stunted growth. And I have different ways that I control aphids. And as I mentioned, I'll leave links to supporting videos down below in the description area. And this here is a picture of a hoverfly maggot looking for aphids to feed on. So now it's time to harvest your peas, provided you have been checking on them oh, for a few minutes about every other day or every day if you can. And when you harvest them, you want to cut them right at the top. Don't cut the top off. Um, they will stay fresher if you leave what I like to call a little cap right there on the top of the pea. And then just store them in a bag in your produce drawer until you're ready to cook them. And I usually just go right inside and cook them up right away because they're just so wonderful. And the way I like to prepare them is I first will trim them. I have seen some descriptions of the sugar snap pea. It says it's stringless, but I've not found that to be the case. So I'll go down from the very top and on the straight side, I'll pull down the string and then I'll go up to the top again and go over the curved side and pull that string down. And then I have, always have just a tiny bit left there on the blossom end. 
So I started the stem end, pull down the string on both sides, and then I get that little tiny bit that's left there on the blossom end, and then they're perfect. So probably my favorite way to prepare sugar snap peas is just to put them in some boiling water for about a minute or two until they're bright green. I absolutely do not overcook these. I like them to be a little bit crisp. And then I'll just melt some butter along with maybe the white end of some scallions, along with some fresh herbs, maybe some dill, maybe some mint, maybe a squirt of lemon, and then just toss them right around in that, um, just on about medium heat. Give them a good sprinkle of salt and there you go it's just real simple and they are so delicious so i look forward to this every spring and i hope that you will too and you can enjoy growing peas in your garden thank you so much for watching and y'all have a beautiful day